Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 25, and we're going to read it down to the end of the chapter in verse 34. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, reading down to verse 34. Let's look at this together, shall we? Beginning in verse 25. The Lord Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body that more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that we that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Shall we bow together in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you again tonight for the opportunity to be in your house. We're thankful for the missionary report we've just heard from the Hughes family in Papua New Guinea. And again, we pray your blessing be upon them, that you give direction to them, that if possible, you might open the door for them to travel and be in Mengen as their heart desires. But Father, we pray you protect them, keep their family safe, particularly during this time of rising coronavirus figures in that region of the world. But Father, as we meet tonight, we're very glad for the opportunity we have and the well-being we have to be in your house. And we pray, Father, that as we again look into the scriptures and through the gospel of the, uh, of the book of Matthew, Lord, we pray that you would bless us with the words of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, that we would see what a master teacher and preacher he was. And uh, God, we pray that his words might indeed search us out and uh, may speak to our souls and challenge our lives and uh, conform us to the image of your Son. Above all, we pray, Father, if there's anyone either in the meeting or out of the meeting watching online who doesn't know the Savior, that they would see tonight, Lord, that their lives are very often exposed by their behavior, even as, as we'll see in this particular text. And Father, we pray tonight if someone sees something of themselves in the Pharisees and in their attitude to life, they'd realize that they need Christ and that they must be born again and would come in simple faith, trusting in him. So, Father, we just pray your blessing upon each and every one. Use this hour for your glory and for the glory of your dear Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, if you were to get to a computer and Google, Google the word trust, you would soon find yourself wading through more than 20 pages of results before you got to one single instance of trust in the common sense of the word trust. In other words, before you got to that common meaning of the word trust, you would find a reference to financial trusts, to business, uh, businesses with trust in their names, to charitable trusts, such as the National Trust, to companies that are eager to help you open personal trusts, all kinds of trusts. And when you finally get through all of those uh, type of trusts, then you get to, uh, to trust as we understand it, but actually you'll more than likely find it's going to be mistrust because then once you've read through all the companies and the charities and so on, you get to psychiatrists and psychiatrists who want to help you with issues relating to mistrust. Perhaps you have suffered as a consequence of infidelity or because of fraud in some way. And so these people offer their services to help you uh, get over that particular hump in your life. And what, I, what we ought to realize is this, that trust is foundational to life. And trust is essential to salvation. And if you cannot trust God, you cannot trust anything or anyone. 
It's as simple as that. If you cannot trust God, you cannot trust anything or anyone. And herein lay the problem of Pharisaism. The Pharisees did not trust God. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, we know that because for a start we've seen that they were engaged in financial scheming. Remember, they were operating the money changers tables in the courts of the temple. They were the ones who were exercising an extortion record in the buying and selling of livestock for, uh, for offering and for sacrifice. And in so doing, they were laying up treasures for themselves upon the earth. In other words, they weren't trusting God to take care of them. They said, look, we've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to secure our own future. And we've got to make sure that we have enough money in the bank should there be uh, some terrible time ahead. And they weren't trusting God at all. But even more than that, their legal system of laws and bylaws really was motivated by self-reliance. You know, by the fact that they had to trust their own goodness in order to get, uh, get approval of God. And they thought the only way into God's kingdom was by means of their own hard work, by the means of their own effort, by the means of their own righteousness and personal discipline. Theirs was a religion of works. And works is the exact opposite of faith or trust. So no surprise now that the Sermon on the Mount takes a turn and Jesus brings his attention and that of his hearers to the matter of trust. Now notice his injunction in verse 25. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Now, verse 25 is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's in the absolute imperative. That's what it is. And uh, this command falls from the lips of the Lord Jesus. And so since it comes directly from his mouth, we can say it has as much force as anything that Moses wrote under the law in the Old Testament. Now notice the reason for the giving of this command. Notice that word, therefore. Therefore is a conjunction. Therefore connects us to all that has gone uh, before. And in particular, it harkens back to that particular uh, statement that is made in verse 4, where the Lord Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and wealth. So he says, you know, you can't serve two masters. Either you'll hit one and hold to the other, uh, or you will uh, hold to the one despite the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, he says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, and so on. So that, therefore, is really tying us into the theme of this particular uh, section of the scriptures. Now, of course, his words were initially directed at the Pharisees who, as I say, set up these financial schemes and who were operating the uh, business in the very temple of God. And remember, these men believed that wealth was a signal of God's blessing. So the more money you had, the more uh, blessed you were. And uh, really, it's a fallacy. It's a fallacy that the Lord Jesus is now about to expose. It's a fallacy that we see today in the, uh, in the prosperity preachers, isn't it? They suggest that because they have these very luxurious lives that the blessing of God somehow rests on them more than other men. Well, that was the mentality of the Pharisees. Without all this Jew business and the razzmatazz, that was the underlying doctrine and dogma that they held to. The more money you have, well, clearly the more blessed you are as an individual. And Jesus is about to knock that theory on the head. Now, they also thought, as I've said, that with their own effort, they could impress both God and man. That they could indeed work up to such a level of righteousness and exactitude in the exercise of the law that they could prove themselves superior to other people and thereby they would win God's favor, that they would impress God and simultaneously impress their fellow citizens and they would certainly find that the kingdom of heaven was open to them. Well, Jesus was completely underwhelmed by that theory. In fact, he said, and remember this in the previous chapter, that they would have to do better. He said if you were going to get into the kingdom, that your righteousness would have to exceed the righteousness of the scribes 
and of the Pharisees. So he said that actually that simply isn't going to hold water. It doesn't matter how much effort you put in, how much religiosity you engage in, how much uh, law keeping you may try to uphold. Never, none of that will be of any avail. All of it is a waste of time because salvation comes at the mercy of God and at the grace of God alone. So what's going on here? Well, in effect, Jesus is accusing these Pharisees of actually hating and despising God. Remember what he said in verse 24? He says, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other. Well, we know what one they loved. They loved the money, didn't they? That's what they were after. He says, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. So they held to their, uh, to their business and to the uh, prosperity that they, were, that they were gaining, and they despised God on the other side. So the Lord is actually accusing the Pharisees of hating God with their own self-centered attitudes and activities. In the words of R. H. Munch, worry or anxiety over material things is practical atheism and an affront to God. So now the Lord Jesus is going to expose their lack of trust and uh, to show that they have no faith in the Father whatsoever. And so he begins by saying, take no thought. Three times he uses this phrase, take no thought. We see it there in verse 25. He says it again in verse 31. Therefore, take no thought. In verse 34, he says, take no thought. And what he means is this. Don't be preoccupied with something. Don't be so distracted by this one thing that nothing else matters. You know, for some people, their every waking thought is about money and material things. You know, I was thinking about this. Obviously, I've been preparing the message, and I just happened upon a television program, and one of these, uh, I think it was Come Down With Me, and I don't watch that program as a rule, but I saw a few seconds of it, and there was a young woman, and she was uh, boasting about how that her purpose in life was to be rich. And how that her desire was to earn at least 50,000 pounds a year. And she says, I want to earn that kind of money and I want to enjoy the nice things that money can buy. That was her life goal. And as you listen to her talk about it, you could tell that she was preoccupied with that thought. That that was the one thing that was governing her activities and her, and her mindset. And so, you know, when a person is living that way, when they're looking for the temporal and thinking about the eternal, well, they're in the firing line now for Jesus' words. When a man becomes preoccupied with material things and those things become the goal of his life, he soon then becomes anxious about his physical life overall, all of his physical needs. He becomes preoccupied with what he will eat and what he will drink and what he will wear. You know, again, you know, I think about our society and, and you know, we, we all enjoy our food and we all, we're all very grateful for the food that's provided for us. But sometimes I look at these cookery programs and I think to myself, these people are just playing with food. They're just playing with it. You know, it, it's, it's actually disgusting in a way that here's a, here's a great swathe of the world that is starving. And here in the West, we're making little, little ornamentations out of our food. And it says something about where we're at as a society. And it says something about luxury and about wealth and about affluence. Because when you get to that place where those are the things that are governing your mind, well, suddenly you start being concerned about what you will eat and what you will wear and what you will drink. And you want the best of this and the best of that. You want to eat in, you know, in Michelin star restaurants. And you want to have the designer clothes that have the very top ranges of clothing. And you want to in indulge yourself in all the materialism that the world has to offer. As Matthew Henry says, the sin of disquieting, distracting, distrustful cares about the things of life are a bad sign that both the treasure and the heart are on the earth. In other words, it's a signal that your eye is evil, even as the Lord Jesus mentioned in verse 23, that your vision is distorted, that you're not seeing things as God would have you see them, that everything is out of proportion and perspective. So Jesus says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment 
You know, as man, he says, in effect, just a body. Is that all we are? Is that all you are? Just a body? Just another material thing? That there's nothing else to us than that? You know, what a great question that is. What a great challenge that is to this secular society. You see, in atheistic thinking, all you are and all I am is a collection of chemicals that just happen to fall into the right place uh, so as to uh, make us what we are uh, today. By some unbelievable accident, all these chemicals got mixed up and managed to fall out in the right order that made you and me and everything you see on the whole planet around you. But Jesus says, actually, you're not just a material thing. You're not just matter. You're far more than that. And the truth is that we all know that we're far more than that. You know, I can't help but thinking, and I'm sure this is true, that atheists, even atheists, have their doubts about the, the uh, notion that we're just matter. There must be moments of atheistic doubt. Moments when he starts to say to himself, you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I do have a soul. And maybe I am going to live forever somewhere. It was very easy to sit in a room and be a textbook atheist, but it's much more difficult when you're standing by your mother's grave and you're thinking, I'll never see her again. Or you yourself have been cut down by some illness and you're looking at eternity in the eye. Then you start to have doubts. I have no question about that. Some of them must begin to question and to say, well, am I really just matter? Am I no different from a block of wood? Am I no different from a, a brick? Am I no different from, a, from a, a piece of metal? Am I just matter? Is that all I am? And Jesus says, no, that's not all you are. He says the life consists of far more than in material things, that there's a part of us that is immaterial, there's a part of us that is spiritual, a part that relates to the things outside of time, and things outside of space, and things outside of matter. So with respect to the future, the question is then, who are you going to trust? You see, if matter is all you are, and matter is all there is, well, here's my suggestion to you, then you make the most of your time here on earth. Because this is all you've got. Get all you can. Don't worry about anybody else. Just live for yourself. You know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's every man for himself. Just get on and do what you can. You're the most important thing on the planet to you at this point in time. But if we are more than matter, then more matters than mere matter. If we're more than matter, more matters than mere matter. If this life is all there is and matters all we are, then you're right to worry about where your next meal is coming from. You're right to worry, worry about what clothes you're going to uh, wear. You're right to worry about the things that you're going to get to drink. You're entirely on your own in this world. This is it. You're the captain of your own destiny. But if there's a God in heaven and if there's a life to come, then we ought to place our future and our welfare in his hands for life doesn't end at the grave. Now notice the illustrations then that the Lord gives. He gives illustrations. It's getting kind of hot in here, isn't it? Can we open another window? Can we open the window at the back there, please? It's getting kind of warm. I don't want the repeat of the Eutychus incident. You remember the Eutychus incident in the book of Acts where it got so hot that the young man fell off the window sill and landed on the ground and had to be resurrected? I'm afraid I'm not an apostle. I don't have the gift of resurrection. So if you fall off your seat and hurt yourself, you're entirely on your own. Great, thank you. Look at these illustrations in verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, he says, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? 
Now, the Lord Jesus was the master preacher. And he knew better than anyone that a painted picture serves far more to the audience than a thousand words. And so he draws upon these illustrations from nature to underscore the point of his sermon. Now, before we go on, let's step back a little bit. And remember, he began this section of the scripture with the word, therefore, that conjunction connecting this tract to the tract previous. And remember what he said in verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. People who are preoccupied with wealth are not trusting God, but are seeking to forge their own security. And by way of correction, Jesus looks to the natural world and he uses birds and flowers to highlight the faithlessness of men. He says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. You know, I thought about this a while ago. It was a cold winter's morning there, back a month or two back. And uh, I was out in my back garden with a little bit of bread and a handful of seed. And I was uh, spreading it there for the birds. And then I thought to myself, you know, these birds have it me. And I get out here in my, in my pajamas in the early in the morning. And my back garden is freezing cold. And I'm providing, uh, providing some food for them. But then I realized I was doing God's work. You know the way you're doing God's work. Because you're providing for these birds that have made no provision for themselves. You see, the birds don't have a big store somewhere. <laughs> They don't have a big barn. They have a, a big seed bank. You know, there's a huge seed bank. I think it's up in northern Scandinavia with uh, literally hundreds of thousands of different kinds of seeds in it. That's created by man, not by the birds. You'd think the birds would want to make one, wouldn't you? But the birds don't store things up. They don't store things in the barns. They don't, even, they don't even plant the seed for next season in the hope that they'll have a harvest. They just carry on day by day. Do you ever see a bird worrying? Do you ever see a bird looking with a scowl on his face like, wonder where my next meal's coming from? Wonder is that pastor going to come out tomorrow morning and feed me? He's not worried. He doesn't care whether I come out or whether I don't come out. He doesn't have a single thought about it. No fox ever fretted because he had only one hole in which to hide. No squirrel ever died of anxiety over the possibility that he should perhaps have laid up more food for the winter. Do you remember this time last year when everybody was rushing out to the shops and buying toilet roll? <laughs> what were we like? <clears throat> toilet roll and pasta. I mean, I know people who don't even eat pasta who stored pasta. People were gathering it in like it was uh, the end of the world. Prime Minister says, you're going to be at home for three weeks. We must stack our houses with toilet roll. <laughs> well, the squirrels didn't worry about it. You know, I walked through the park every day and the squirrels were there. And I would see one squirrel and another squirrel say, you know what? We're at a toilet roll. <laughs> we're going to have to get more nuts this year because there's a lockdown on. He didn't worry about it. None of those animals worry a thing about it. No dog ever lost any sleep over the fact that he hadn't enough bones laid aside for his declining years. Now, of course, you might say, well, that's a ridiculous analogy. Those creatures don't have the intelligence to think that thing through, to fret in that kind of way. However, the fact remains that for us to engage in such anxiety is foolish and sinful on our part. It's foolish because it doesn't help the situation. Notice what the Lord says in verse, uh, verse uh, 26 and 27. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? If you're a short person and you're worried about it, well, worrying about it isn't going to make you a taller person, is it? You're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and find you're six foot two tall all of a sudden because you worried about it during the night. You can do nothing about your leg length. You're stuck with it. So why worry about it? But not only that, understand, not only is it foolish because you can't help the situation, it's sinful because all that anxiety is is a form of practical atheism. It's a lack of genuine trust 
in God. And as children of the kingdom, we should know that we have a heavenly Father who provides for birds, and yet he places a far greater value upon us than he does upon them. Therefore, the antidote to anxiety in our lives is a Christ-like trust of the Word of God. You know, the Christian should carry every concern to God in prayer, shouldn't we? I like what Corrie Ten Boom said when she said, If a case is too small to be turned into a prayer, it is too small to be made into a burden. I like that statement. If it's too small to be turned into a prayer, it's too small to be uh, turned into a burden, made into a burden. So faith in God's care over us enables us to live one day at a time. Now that's not to say that we uh, should be careless about tomorrow, that we shouldn't think about our future and, uh, and make wise investments and maybe put aside pension and all that. That's not what Jesus was saying. But what he was saying here is that we should be free from an undue concern over these things. What he's saying is that there shouldn't be a preoccupation with these things. And he says, why take thought for your raiment? That's an old English word for clothes. Why worry about your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. The lilies here are the hula lily that grows wild in Israel. It's a beautiful plant. You know, in, in our garden growing up, my mother would always have planted orange lilies. The orange lily is a hula lily. You know, if you, all of us have been at funerals and we've all seen uh, wreaths and seen uh, floral tributes that contain lilies. Those are hula lilies. They're a beautiful flower. But even the greatest of kings could not cover themselves in the finery of the hula lily. No matter how, how much silk he might put on, no matter how uh, luxurious his clothes could be, he couldn't possibly produce, there wasn't anyone and there still isn't anyone on earth who can produce a material as beautiful as, as that of the lily's petal. Just can't be done. And Jesus says, look, Look at those lilies. They don't toil. They don't spin. They don't do this by themselves. They don't have to labor night and day. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for them. I give them that beautiful petal. I clothe them in this way. And then he says, I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like unto these. Now remember too that many of these people to whom he was speaking were involved in textiles. Remember what he said earlier in, in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth doth corrupt. A lot of them were making money out of the clothes business, out of the rag tree. So the Lord says, Listen, you folks who are concerned about clothes, have a look at the lilies. Have a look at the material there. Go and have a look at their petals. You can't produce anything like that. Here's, the, here's an act of God. He says, you people who are striving to produce and own the best designer clothing, listen, even your top brands are no match for the clothing of the wildflowers of the field. And notice his application in verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? What's he saying here? Here's God puts all of this effort, and of course it's no effort for God, he does it by the word of his mouth, but here's God who produces this beauty in the lily, in a flower that is temporary, that is just going to blossom and be gone, and, uh, in, and that's it. Then we'll use whatever is remaining uh, of the plant uh, to make bricks with, uh, and to throw into the oven. In our back garden, there is a beautiful camellia, uh, and uh, you know, has the most glorious show at this time of year, these really deep pink flowers. I mean, a fantastic looking plant. But that plant only lasts about two to three weeks. You know, it, it blossoms at this time of the year, and uh, hardly do you see those flowers come out, and you'll go out one day, and it'll be all deadheads. Gone. The, leaf, the, the petals will have fallen off. 
The same with tulips. You remember a year or two ago, we had some uh, Dutch tourists who came to the service, and then they sent us, very kindly sent us, a box of tulip bulbs. Those of you who were here, I don't think we've ever received such an unusual gift uh, as a church. We've received many gifts, but never before tulip bulbs. And so uh, we got these tulip bulbs, and we put them at the back there, and, and we said, take them. It's a gift from these dear friends who've come and enjoyed our services, and, and, and they sent these beautiful flowers for us to enjoy. And many of you took those tulips, and I imagine if you've planted them about now, they've come up in your garden. At least ours are up. Ours are up, and the, uh, you know, the heads are about to, uh, to bloom. Uh, but here's the thing about a tulip, and, and these, these were beautiful tulips, by the way, that those folks brought. Uh, but but when, you, when they actually bloom, you think, isn't that a gorgeous plant? And then what happens? And like about two days later, the wind comes. And what are you left with? A stalk. You go, what happened to my tulip? It's gone with the wind. Been cleaned off. And this is Jesus' point. If God exercises such care over lesser things in life, over birds and over flowers, over things that are insignificant and fleeting, don't you think he'll take care of you? Don't you think he'll take care of me? Don't you think he has your interest in your life? Don't you think he has an interest in your life? Don't you think he has an interest in your soul? You see, when a man worries about his future, when he makes his own plans for tomorrow's security, so as his life is preoccupied with wealth, well then, that's his faithlessness being revealed. Hence, Jesus says at the, uh, at the end of verse 30, I haven't talked about the, the plants and how they are here today and gone tomorrow. He says, shall he not much more clothe you? And notice the, this line, O ye of little what? faith. This is a condemnation of Phariseeism. It says, you Pharisees who are down there at the temple, ripping off the people who are coming up to worship from various parts of the world. You Pharisees who have put out your table full of, of uh, sanctuary shekels in order to exchange with those dear people who are coming in to worship God, and you're extracting from them you know, all kinds of money as they come. He says, you people are faithless. You're faithless. You see, faith tells me that God loves me. Faith tells me that Christ died for me. Faith tells me that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Faith tells me that my future, both temporal and eternal, are in his hands. So I don't worry about tomorrow. I don't care what happens tomorrow generally. Because as Jesus says, the things of tomorrow will likely take care of themselves. Now notice his invitation then in verse 31. Therefore, he says, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Back in the 19th century, there was a, an essayist and a historian by the name of Thomas Carlyle. And you can go to London, to Chelsea in London, and you can visit Thomas Carlyle's home there. It's a National Trust property. And uh, if you go there, you'll find that Thomas Carlyle had built into his house a room that was almost soundproofed so that he could go in there and he could work without hearing the noise in the street outside. However, unfortunately for Thomas Carlyle, one of his neighbors owned uh, a cockerel, a rooster. And so that cockerel would, uh, would let rip during the night, would let rip early in the morning. And so he was a little fed up with it, and he went and spoke to his neighbor. And uh, he explained that, you know, he, uh, he was being disturbed in his sleep by the uh, rooster uh, crowing uh, throughout the night and early in the morning. And the neighbor said this, well, look, the, the rooster only crows uh, three times in the night. And after that, you know, and you know, consider that, that's not very much. That can be a terrible annoyance to you. But Carlyle said this to him, if you only knew what I suffer waiting for the rooster to crow. 
You see, there's a natural part in all of us that is that way, isn't there? Let me give you a more modern example. Perhaps you've got to get up early tomorrow morning, say at 4 o'clock, to get to the airport because you're going on holiday. You've got one of those crazy early flights. You know, I appreciate the holidays are banned right now, but bear with me, there used to be a thing called holidays. Uh, so you're going to go to the airport. They've given you one of these ridiculously early flights. You've got to get on this plane at 4 o'clock in the morning. So you set your alarm really, really early, haven't you? Maybe you've set two alarms. And then you go to bed. And when you get into bed, what do you think? You think, what will happen if that alarm doesn't work? <laughs> now, why, did, why would suddenly the alarm not work? It's, and, and even if you set two alarms, what are the chances of two alarms not working? So every all through the night, you're fretting about the possibility that the alarm isn't going to go off. And sometimes you'll lift the clock and you'll look to see if the, the alarm is on. Yeah, it's on. And you put it down. You say, I'll go to sleep now. But then you're worried just in case it might go off and it won't ring for you at the appropriate time and then after fretting through the night you finally fall asleep about 3.30 and what happens? 4 o'clock the alarm goes off! You see the novelist A.J. Cronin said this Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow it only saps today of its strength and that's true but far worse than that, worry is an indication that we believe that God is not looking out for us. That God cannot look after us. John R. Rice, the great evangelist, said this, that worry puts a question mark where God has placed a period or a full stop. God has said, trust me, full stop. And we put a question mark on the end of that and say, well, I'm not sure that I can trust you. Now, do you see how that's unbelief? God says, believe in me, full stop. You put a question mark on that and you say, I'm not sure I can believe in you. Believe in you? The Bible says that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And then people come along, put a question on mark on that. That which God has promised with a full stop, we put a question mark on. And we say, really? Believe? That's all you've got to do? you just got to believe in that? There must be more to it than that. And that's faithlessness. That's unbelief. So the Lord Jesus says then, Take therefore no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? He says, Don't even think about these things. Stop worrying about tomorrow. Stop worrying about what tomorrow brings. Faith leaves tomorrow in the hand of the only one who can hold it. Stop worrying about possessions. Stop worrying about property. Stop worrying about material things. You know, a concern for those things is indicative of a worldly spirit. Look at verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles, that is the, the heathen, seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. You know, a worldly spirit is revealed in that attitude of anxiety. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to watch out for me. Well, I know God says, trust me, but can I really trust him? I don't think I really can. I better just take care of this myself. And the Lord says, you're behaving like a pagan. You're behaving like a heathen. You're behaving, you're behaving like a Gentile. <clears throat> for after all these things through the Gentiles, your heavenly, does your heavenly Father not know that you have need of all these things? You think about that. You know, those of us who are parents have looked at the needs of our children over the years, and, you know, we know what they need, don't we? You know, a, a child rarely notices that his trousers are creeping up his legs. But the mother will notice. A father will notice. A child doesn't notice when necessarily when there's a hole in the bottom of his shoe. But a good parent will notice. And what will they do? Will they just sit there and say, well, he's got a hole in the bottom of his shoe, I'll just wait for him to notice? Or will he make provision for new shoes? He'll make provision for new shoes, won't they? He'll say, we need to get that child some new shoes. We need to uh, get him some new trousers. We need to get him some clothes that fit him. 
And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, is your heavenly Father any less than that? When he sees your need, do you not think he's going to provide for your need? When he sees that you have something that, that is required, is he not going to take care of that requirement? Is he not going to requisition the resources of heaven on your behalf to meet that need if it's really a need? You say, well, I'm not so sure. That's faithlessness. That's where the Pharisees were at. God always provides for our needs, not our creeds, but our needs. But Jesus says, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. You know, I don't, but I'm not a good shopper. I don't like shopping. I'm like most men. I don't like shopping. I shop with a purpose. Okay, I don't shop for recreation. If I want to be, have a day, you know, of recreation, you know, I'll go out into the country or, you know, watch a movie or go to the beach or something. If you say to me, oh, you got a day off, let's go shopping. <laughs> I say, are you on drugs? What's wrong with you? But every now and then, like all good husbands, I, my wife and I will go along to the shopping mall. She'll be looking for something. And uh, she'll say, I'm going to buy this or that. I need to get a new dress for this or that. Will you come with me? I'm usually observing people. You know what I see? The best place for this is the Trafford Centre in Manchester. They have the most serious shoppers at the Trafford Centre in Manchester. I mean, those people are shopping like their life depended on it. Seriously. I mean, they've got this very determined, and it's mostly the women, I have to say. They've got this very determined face. You know, they're like a horse with blinkers. They come down the aisle like this, you know, they're going to a particular store. They get into the aisles and they're pushing around. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what is wrong with you? What is wrong? You're shopping like your life depends on it. But our life doesn't depend on that. Our life depends on the grace and the mercies of God. So to people who are caught up in that kind of faithless, materialistic, consumerist existence, Jesus has a word of advice. He says, first of all, put first things first. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That is, those things are secondary and if you need them, God will provide them for you. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's first things first. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30 puts it this way. Them that honor me, I will honor. Those who put me first, I will take care of. Those who put him first are met with his blessing. Those who put his will above all else are met with his presence and his power in their lives. But the opposite is also true. Do you remember the prophecy of Haggai? Haggai is, speaks to a people who have come back from exile, and they began to build the temple even as they were told to do by God, but they got waylaid, and in the period in which they were waylaid, they began to get caught up in their own DIY projects, and they began to use some of the materials from the temple to, uh, to improve their homes. And the Lord comes along to them and he says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? That was the fashion of the day. And this house, my house, lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat and you have not enough. You drink and you're not filled with drink. You clothe you and there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. And what the Lord is saying to those people at that point in time is, Get your priorities right. Put me first. Put my house first. Be committed to me. And Jesus is saying the same thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. I don't want you to be seeking after interest on the exchange rate. I don't want you to be seeking to extort worshippers as they come into the temple complex. I don't want you amassing wealth and believing that that's the blessing of God upon your life. I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the things of God. And whatever you've got need of after that, God will take care of. I'll be honest with you, that's my testimony. You know, David said it well. He says, I've been old and I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. I, that's my testimony. God has always provided for my need. Always. 
You know, in the 40 some years that I've been saved, that's what has happened. And I'm quite sure he will continue to do that till I get into glory. And he doesn't just do it for me. You know, it's not that I'm special. It's not that I'm like the milky bar kid. <laughs> that you're all somehow or other excluded from this. No, no, no. This is, this is true for all of us. But God says you've got to get your priorities right. There's the first piece of advice. Here's the second piece of advice. Live one day at a time. Notice what the Lord says there in verse 34. Take no thought, therefore, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Here's how James puts it in James chapter 4. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know what, not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? And is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Now you've heard this said before. This is no new thing. But the truth is, tomorrow never what? Comes. Because you've only got today. Tomorrow never comes. Any one of us could die today. This could be the last day you have. And all of our best laid plans and schemes and, and, uh, and mechanisms whereby we intend to get wealthy, well, all of that could be gone in a moment and all our treasured possessions be gone with it. So instead, faith says, I trust God for today. Tomorrow is a different day. I'm just going to trust God for today. That's all I got to do. I just got to get through this 24 hours trusting God and I'm going to go to bed and when I get up in the morning and my eyes open, guess what I'm going to do today? I'm going to trust God today too. I'm just going to trust him for today. Now the truth is that you cannot trust anybody you do not know. That's the reality. If you don't know someone, you're not going to trust them, are you? And if you do, you're likely or you may be likely to get burned. And let me give you an example. Many years ago when I was a young pastor and hardly had very much of this world's goods, although the Lord took care of all my needs. But I didn't have much of this world's goods. A young woman stopped by our church. She was a legal secretary. She was very well dressed. She was very well spoken. She was quite an attractive woman. And she came in and she began to weep. And she told me a story how that she and her husband were in trouble financially and that they had some bills to pay and everything was against them. And in a moment of temptation, she went into the petty cash box of her employer and had taken 40 pounds to pay a bill. But to her surprise, her boss needed some of that money and there was insufficient funds in the box now to give him the cash that he needed to do whatever he was going to do. And she was afraid she was going to lose her job and that she was going to be in terrible trouble and so on. And she begged me to lend her 40 pounds until payday and she would come back and pay me the 40 pounds by the end of that week when she would be paid. Well, I was busy. Now, you've got to understand, live, as it was in Dublin, in Dublin, you've got beggars coming to the door, people begging money off you uh, at the church door regularly, regularly, sometimes two, three, four times a week. There'd be. So I, would, I was really quite skilled by the time I was in the, my pastorate there in questioning beggars. And oftentimes I found out that many of them were just liars who were just trying to get money out of you. But this woman was different. You know, she didn't look like the others. She, she, and, she, you know, she's genuinely weeping. It seems she was genuinely weeping. Anyway, long story short, I loaned her the 40 pounds. Now, we didn't have that money to lend her. But, you know, I, I, I felt pity on her. I, you know, I felt sorry for her. And I lend, loaned her the 40 pounds so that she could keep her job and, you know, and carry on. Friday came and she didn't show. I lost 40 pounds. She never came back. I never saw her again, ever. And, you know, of course, I told Hazel that I loaned her the 40 pounds. And uh, about that time, you know, 40 pounds was a lot of money to us. It was a lot of money to us at that time. And, you know, we had children and all the rest of it. So now, you know, I felt like an idiot because I had jeopardized our finances uh, in order to try and help this woman. 
And, uh, you know, I, every night I was beating myself over the head with it in bed and, uh, until I read the book of Proverbs where it says, I can't, I'm going to paraphrase this, it says, uh, the wicked borroweth and giveth not again, lendeth not again, uh, but the righteous shows mercy and lendeth. And the Lord said, well, you were an idiot, but at least you were a righteous idiot. So I didn't know the woman. I, I loaned her money. It didn't work out. Well, where does that put me now if somebody else comes asking me money? Makes me think, well, I got stung the last time. Do I really want to give money to this person who I don't know? In contrast to that story, at that time there was a young man who's now the pastor of the church that I was pastoring who was going to Bible college. He was going to Bible college in America, in Wisconsin. And in order to get into the United States of America, he had to have a certain amount of money in the bank so that he could prove that he could maintain his, uh, his uh, income while he was there and wouldn't be a burden to the state. Uh, and so he had to have a certain... Now, he was a little bit short. I didn't have a house. We didn't have a house. But what I did have was I had about £5,000 in the bank, which we had put aside in the hope that someday we could buy a house. So we liked his house. And so we, we came to this arrangement that I would give him my £5,000 and he would, he would give us the house and we could get a mortgage and uh, go on and live in that house. Well, that was well and good. He took the £5,000, off he went to America. I came to get a mortgage. I went into my bank. I explained to the bank manager what had happened. I said, listen, uh, I've put a deposit down on this house. I've gave the owner £5,000. I'd like to get a mortgage for the rest of it. And he said, so you've given £5,000? I said, yes. He said, have you got a solicitor? I said, no. He said, did you have anybody witness that you gave him £5,000? I said, no. He said, he's, he's gone to America with your £5,000? I said, yes. He says, how do you know that he isn't just stealing from you? And I said, because I know him. He's a, he, you know, he's a, he's a brother in Christ. You know, he's, he's my friend. Uh, he wouldn't do that to me. I know him. And the, the bank manager, of course, he's, he's a man that works in hard figures. He just can't get his head around it. He's looking at me like, this guy's a total idiot. He expects me to lend him a mortgage, have him just give 5,000 pounds to a guy who's going to America. But here's the difference between the first person and the second person. The first person I did not know. It's hard to trust somebody you don't know. The second person I did know. Now, Corey Ten Boom again offered this great prescription for those who are faithless and anxious about tomorrow. She said this, look around and you'll be distressed. That's where a lot of folks are today. They're looking at the news and they're distressed. If you want to live a life that's a little less stressful, here's a good idea. Switch off the news. A lot of people look at the news, they're distressed. Look around and you'll be distressed, she said. Look within and you'll be depressed. And that's where a lot of people are today also. There's more talk today about mental health problems than ever before because people are inward looking. But she said, look at Jesus and be at rest. And that's the truth. You see, the Pharisees, for all their religiosity and all their wealth and all their law-keeping, were deeply unhappy men at heart. And the disciples of Christ, who comparatively had very little of this world's goods in relation to the Pharisees, found that they had joy in Jesus. You see, it's all about who you know. And if you know the Lord, you can rest in him no matter what the circumstances are that surround you. Now, here's the question. Do you know him? Is he your savior? Have you placed your tomorrow in terms of time and eternity into his all-keeping hands? Those nail-scarred hands that bear your sin debt. Can you trust them with your life? You see, I believe you can. I believe that if you'll do that, he'll take care of you. He'll meet you at the point of your need. And if you're not a believer tonight, I encourage you to put your trust in him, to just come and say, tell him something he already knows. Admit yourself a sinner. Listen, he's not going to be surprised in the heavens. He's not going to say, oh, I didn't realize you were a sinner. He already knows you're a sinner. 
He knows everything you do, everywhere you go, every conversation you have, every thought that runs through your head. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows when you sit down and when you stand up. He knows when you go to bed at night and when you rise in the morning. He knows what you had for breakfast. Don't you think he knows that you're a sinner? Of course he knows. But he just wants you to admit it. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. Agree with him about it. Confess yourself a sinner. And then believe. Say, Lord, I'm going to trust in your goodness. I'm going to trust in your grace for tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about my life. I'm placing my life into your hands. I'm leaving it with you. You are the one in whom I will have confidence. Lord, save me. And you know what? He will. He will. But you've just got to call. And if you're a believer, and you are struggling with anxiety, and some believers are, maybe even more so in these uncertain times, well, listen, friends, that too is faithlessness. And King David wrote, My times are in thy hand. And so they are. You know, God is not moved by pandemics or global economics. The world changes, but God remains the same. He's immutable. He never changes. And he has all of the affairs of man in his hands. And he is absolutely worthy of our trust. So stop being anxious. Stop being careful about tomorrow and start trusting the one to whom you've already committed your soul. May God bless these thoughts to your hearts this evening.